Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello and welcome to CSIS. My name is Jacob Kurtzer. I'm the Director and Senior Fellow of the Humanitarian Agenda at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Thank you all for joining us today for this important conversation on safeguarding humanitarian action in Afghanistan. Today's conversation takes place in the wake of what has been a very difficult day, a very difficult few weeks, and in fact, very difficult year. Um, for the civilian population in Afghanistan and for the community of people who care about the humanitarian and, and circumstances in that country. Um, there's obviously been an intense amount of focus on the situation in and around the airport in Kabul and the process of evacuation and refugees and, and all those considerations that are capturing people's attention on the news. But we also know that Afghanistan has suffered from over 20 years of conflict, that it has had substantial humanitarian impacts for the population. And those impacts have been exacerbated in the past year by the COVID-19 pandemic, um, by drought conditions, by and by a substantial increase in armed violence um, since the middle beginning of last year in 2019. And so we're really grateful for your attention today to this issue and for our three panelists um, to talk about these issues and think about ways that even in this very complex moment of transition and uncertainty, um, we can think about and take steps today to protect humanitarian action, to make sure that the international community continues to respond to the needs of the totality of the population, the civilian population of Afghanistan. So we're very grateful today to welcome Zora Bahman, the country director for Search for Common Ground, joining us today from Dubai, or Vasi Patel, the head of protection services for the UN High Commission for Refugees based in Bangkok, and Katie Strafolino, the senior manager at Interaction for Humanitarian Practice. Thank you all three for being with us today. Zura, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Um, Search for Common Ground, based in Kabul, um, is, a, is an organization that engages in these kinds of peace building activities. And I'm wondering, you know, we're thinking about the total the totality of the humanitarian picture. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful you can share with us based on your experience and based on the experience of your colleagues, what are the challenges today facing the civilian population in Afghanistan and particularly, as we all know, the, the women and the girls in Afghanistan um, in the context of the upheaval that we're seeing right now? Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think uh, it's a very tough time for us and um, as an Afghan woman, I uh, find several challenges um, as a professional, but also as uh, personally as an Afghan woman. And on top of the list would be the uncertainty. Um, we have had an, a huge change in the last few uh, in the last week or so. Um, on the 15th of August, everybody went back to work. Um, everybody started their week, and we were in the middle of a meeting that uh, we found out that the Taliban were very near, and we had to really think uh, whether this was a rumor like the previous times or was it, whether this was true. And within minutes, everything uh, that we thought was uh, life in Kabul collapsed. However, since then, very little has become clear as to um, who is governing us, what do they believe in, uh, should we base our understanding of the Taliban on our previous experiences, or should we take their word um, for the change that they claim that they've experienced and the freedom that they are supposed to be giving us? There are little uh, pieces of information that they're sharing with us, but there is a lot of disconnect between the information they're sharing with us and, their, and, and, and turning that into practice. That's number one issue. The other issue is the, obviously, security. We have, um, I mean, there is security, but I was talking to a um, friend of mine in Kabul, actually two friends, and one of them said that the security feels like the calm that you feel when you visit the graveyard. And the other one says that the outside is calm, but our heart is um, in a anxious and in anxiety. And this is exactly what we're feeling. So yes, of course, um, the number of people being killed in the, in the active combat has reduced, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but we don't know if we have physical security, if we are secure due to 
uh, the differences in our, uh, you know, regardless of differences in our views, our past activities, our associations, our uh, our 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 um, uh, work background, and so on. So this is also a certain uncertainty, but also insecurity. There's a lot of um, confirmed and unconfirmed um, uh, news that uh, people are going into uh, into Afghan people's homes outside Kabul and in Kabul. And some of them are um, criminal elements, but some of them are, are Taliban who are actually looking for people despite the amnesty. So these are lo lots of issues that we have to think about. And we also have to personally deal with the, the sense of loss. Many of us have to uh, have lost our entire support network. Many offices have closed down overnight, and we are not sure what or where do we stand, uh, not only with regards to what the Taliban uh, thinks our right to employment should be, but also what our employer thinks. Um, are, a, is aid going to continue? Um, we have um, issues with uh, our banking system. The cash that we, uh, that we had in our pockets on Sunday, the 15th of August, is the cash we've had to survive with, and we have no idea how the global politics is going to play out and ensure or not ensure our access to cash. So these are some of the concerns uh, that we have got um, at the top of our minds right now. Thank you very much. You, you know, you, you spoke about uncertainty, um, that sense of loss and, and insecurity. These are these are three variables that, and in particular, that uncertainty and that insecurity that can um, have a very detrimental impact on the ability of international aid providers to to continue to support. And so I'd like to turn to you, Orvasi, and maybe if we can expand the scope a little bit um, to before August 15th and then today, can you share with us a little bit from the UNHCR perspective, what are the short and long-term humanitarian priorities for your agency and for the international humanitarian structure writ large? Thank you very much, Jake. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, the Centre, for organising this important, as you and as you said yourself, timely event, as well as for the for inviting UNHCR to speak alongside other distinguished panelists and experts whose organisations, like ours, are working inside Afghanistan right now. As you mentioned, I'm based uh, in the region, but presently, presently, but before this assignment, I had the privilege of working in Kabul. Um, and prior to that, also in Mazar Sharif. So my heart goes out to everybody who's been suffering uh, in the recent past. I'd like to also express our deepest condolences to all those killed at Kabul airport yesterday in the tragic attack, uh, including the Afghans and US service personnel, and wish a full recovery to all those injured. I know all our thoughts are with the people there. As our High Commissioner said yesterday, the incident is, ad in addition to everything else, should make all of us want to want to be more determined than ever not to leave the Afghan people alone. Now in this time to do more for Afghans at risk and in need and those who are displaced or refugees. So in terms of, uh, in response to your question about what are the short and long-term humanitarian priorities in Afghanistan, this is really, really a very, very important question. The title of this event is Safeguarding Humanitarian Action and in the short term that is our number one priority. We must remain, as we have done for four decades, to support and stand by the Afghan people for as long as it is safe for our staff to do so. We are already witnessing a huge humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan with nearly half the population in need of humanitarian assistance. This has been caused, as you know, by the multiple effects of forced displacement, drought, COVID-19, insecurity and conflict, as well as economic challenges and it's really not the time for us to leave. We need to stay and deliver. For UNHCR, the priorities within that humanitarian action are for now to meet the urgent needs of the internally displaced communities, as well as continue our community programming across provinces, which has already reached 1.3 million people this year. This includes schools, medical facilities, and infrastructure. For now, we are taking the evolving situation one day at a time, constantly planning, monitoring and adapting. We of course need to have longer term priorities, but we also need to have some time to see how things develop. For us, as the Refugee and Displacement Agency, one of our main priorities will be, will be to help find solutions and provide protection to internally displaced people, 
totaling nearly 33.5 million altogether now. So they can return to their homes if they wish and restart their lives in a safe and dignified way. We will continually re reassess our longer term priorities as we have more clarity on the overall political and security situation. Thank you, Rossi, for that overview. Um, you talked about staying and continuing to support as long as the security allows. I, I want to turn to you, Katie. Uh, Interaction is a coalition of uh, voluntary US-based international NGOs. I think I got that right. Um, numerous US-based organizations have announced their intention to stay and deliver. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the plans are for these organizations and how the US-based NGOs are viewing the humanitarian landscape and the challenges ahead? Yeah, thanks, Jake, and thanks to CSIS for organizing, again, this super timely discussion. So, I mean, as my colleagues are already um, alluded to, the, the key concern right now for the humanitarian NGO community is really around how to best protect and support our NGO staff, and particularly how do we best support and protect our female NGO staff. Um, you know, the recent environment, as we've seen it, um, has led to a high rate of attrition um, of, of female NGO staff um, because they and their families have faced security threats. Um, and, and what this practically means um, in the context of Afghanistan, um, where there are cultural considerations associated with mixed gender interactions, um, if we don't do what we can now to retain and support female NGO staff, humanitarians won't necessarily have the ability to provide life-saving relief to Afghan women and girls. So this is a huge priority and a huge need and is going to be key for the NGO community to be able to stay and deliver. Um, so right now we really need to be doing everything we collectively can to support female NGO staff. Um, in Afghanistan, as, as many folks know, the operating environment varies um, province to, to province, um, and we need as much consistency on access as possible um, to facilitate a needs-based assistance um, wherever, and that includes consistency in allowing um, uh, female NGO staff to be able to continue to work in a safe and unfettered manner. Um, now, practically, you know, how do we do that? Um, first and foremost, you know, we need to be able to maintain, to establish and maintain principled um, humanitarian access with the Taliban, um, who are now, you know, essentially the de facto authority, um, as well as with other armed actors. Um, so, you know, humanitarian principles guide um, the community's approach, neutrality, impartiality, humanity. Um, what does this practically mean now moving forward? So in terms of you know the Taliban and, and other actors, it means all conflict parties must facilitate safe, rapid and unimpeded access for both male and female humanitarian staff. Um, humanitarian organizations must be allowed to engage with all parties um, and operate in all areas without interference. Um, they also um, must be allowed uh, to um, provide impartial humanitarian activities on the sole basis of need, regardless of uh, gender, ethnicity, um, location, or, or any other factors. Um, they also must be allowed to conduct independent needs assessments um, and including looking at, you know, established vulnerability criteria um, that includes gender issues. Um, there also really needs to be accountability um, for if and, and potentially when violations of access, um, principled access agreements occur. Um, you know, uh, they, they can impede um, humanitarian action. It's a bit of a fine line, but there does need to be um, a, a degree of accountability there. Um, and then lastly, you know, states really need to ensure that uh, sanctions um, or any counterterror measures um, comply with uh, international humanitarian and, and human rights law. Um, on that note, um, as again, Zura was, was alluding to at the beginning, financial access um, and counterterror measures are a huge um, challenge um, and, and concern for the community as, as well as funding. Um, on financial access, these issues are really wide ranging. Um, uh, right now, um, it's incredibly challenging um, to, get, um, to get cash into the country, um, to be able to pay staff, cover operational costs, 
we really need a pipeline to be able to do that now, um, and, and that's an urgent priority. Um, related, um, the NGO community does need additional U.S. legal safeguards um, to be able to move forward in this new operational environment, engaging with the Taliban, um, you know, as the de facto authority to be able to provide life-saving relief where it's needed the most. Um, and then just a quick note on funding. Um, I mean, the NGO community, as you know, comprising the bulk of frontline um, responders right now in, in Afghanistan, the community needs more humanitarian funding. And that needs to go directly to NGOs and it needs to be as flexible as possible to allow NGOs to really be able to pivot on the fly to meet ever-changing needs in, in this type of, of fluid environment. Um, and then just lastly, um, on the regional dimension, um, the regional countries, yeah, uh, Pakistan, um, Iran, I mean, they're they're both they're they're traditionally very challenging for both the NGO community to operate, um, you know, the the bureaucratic and administrative impediments. Um, and, and what have you um, are, are very challenging. Um, so there needs to be humanitarian diplomacy now with these regional countries to ensure there is a conducive operational environment if we're faced with a situation um, you know, of, of mass influx of, of refugees. Um, NGOs need to be able to scale up quickly to be able to support them in partnership with our UN colleagues. Um, uh, so yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll stop there, um, but those are the main issues that the NGO community is, is concerned about and, and what we really need to be able to safely stay and deliver humanitarian assistance. Thanks, Katie. I, I just want to stay with you and, and unpack one of the issues that you raised. Um, the U.S.-based organizations, the entire of the humanitarian response now navigates or has to navigate a, an Afghanistan de facto leadership that includes people designated as um, foreign terrorist organizations. And, and so you talked about the sanctions and, and some of the other restrictive measures. Are you able to just unpack that a little bit for our audience on some of the, the steps that would be needed to be taken by the U.S. government, let alone the U.N. and, and other, other, other donor governments? Sure. So the Taliban in Afghanistan is is they're not an FTO. Um, they are, however, a specially designated global terrorist. Um, so that's the SDGT is, is the designation right now. Um, so I'll just note, you know, the NGO community and, and the UN, you know, everyone that's that's worked in Afghanistan over the last few decades has significant experience working with um, the, the Taliban. Um, the NGO community also has significant experience working in other highly volatile areas areas around the world um, with designated entities, Syria, Somalia, um, elsewhere. So the community has, as a result, um, developed significant due diligence machinery um, it built into how they operate to be able to ensure that aid reaches populations in need wherever they're located. So just to say that the NGO community structurally has the ability to stay and deliver services right now. But as you referenced, Jake, they do acquire additional legal safeguards in this new operating environment to be able to comfortably continue um, without fear of, of legal action. So um, just to say a note on what the SDGT designation means, and then I'll go into what is specifically needed. So this designation means that U.S. persons um, and U.S. Uh, government grantees are prohibited um, directly or indirectly from engaging in any transaction um, or dealing in property or interest with the Taliban. So in order to be able to proceed with life-saving activities, there needs to be a safeguard for the community to be able to do that type of work, um, you know, and, and engage in the Taliban in that way. So specifically what we need from the United States government now um, is an OFAC general license um, that's modeled off of the Yemen general license. Um, and any general license would really need to be broad enough to include transactions involving the Taliban um, that would be necessary to support ordinary humanitarian activities um, to include transfer of funds, um, securing of licenses um, uh, and payment of import uh, duties and fees. So. Um, this uh, general license um, should be accompanied by guidance um, as well that clarifies which entities are considered to be part of the Taliban um, and to help address other interpretation issues that really hamstring efforts at the field level um, to provide life-saving um, assistance. Now, this license and this guidance also um, is advisable to be accompanied by public guidance for financial institutions. Um, uh, 
outlining that they are indeed protected through these new safeguards and that they're authorized to do business with humanitarian actors. Um, right now, we're starting to see banks de-risking um, and, and a chilling effect. Um, and we really need um, that communication and support between the U.S. government and financial institutions, reminding them that they are protected, you know, if and when a license comes through, um, because that will be very helpful in terms of dealing with the with the cash problem and the ability to pay um, pay staff and, and run programs. Um, so, I mean, again, this this really is the only way the community will will be able to move forward um, in, in the near future. Um, and then just likewise for the multilateral arena, um, you know, looking at the Security Council and, and, and what have you. Um, any, you know, restrictive measure um, that that might, you know, in the future come out needs similar humanitarian safeguards built in, um, again, to just allow the humanitarian community to be able to stay and, and continue to deliver, you know, without fear of kind of legal repercussion. Um, so you know. um, you, you, there's a lot in there. And I think the, the key point is that um, private assurances or, or suggestions are not sufficient in a context like Afghanistan. We really need the United States government to to provide the official guarantees. And I think, you know, one of the lessons the humanitarian community learned from the Yemen example that you referenced was um, that in some contexts, general licenses um, may be useful in meeting some of the needs, but actually what's necessary is to avoid, I think, in this context, this is my two cents, um, a rush to designate the Taliban as an FTO because that will create a lot of additional complications that will um, jeopardize a humanitarian response in an already uncertain environment. So thanks for, for unpacking that for us. Um, Zara, I want to come back to you. Um, both, both Katie and Ravasi talked about engagement with the Taliban and, and Search for Common Ground released a statement um, pressing for engagement by all parties. Uh, including the, between the international community and the Taliban to avoid exacerbating the humanitarian crisis. And can you just um, speak to this further, explaining you know, how this engagement should work from the eyes of Search for Common Ground from the perspective of Kabul? Yes, we believe at Search that um, this engagement is going to harm um, normal, ordinary Afghan people the most. And while I appreciate the sentiments behind uh, a lot of hardline disengagement, uh, calls for disengagement from the Taliban. And I can see as an Afghan woman that lived through the first round of Taliban rule, that it comes from a real, um, a, a place of real concern. Um, while I respect that, it is really important to uh, continuously engage with the Taliban. And we believe that uh, this, this engagement should be at multiple levels. Um, we believe, for example, that Afghanistan is a uh, well, like many other countries in the world, um, a country where there are constant negotiations happening. Um, they're constantly, we are constantly bartering, we're constantly finding the common ground at the district level, at the village level, at, 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 at provincial level, and then at national um, and international level. And we believe that uh, we need to uh, create a strategy to engage based on this fact. And we cannot uh, decide to engage at the political level only and then expect it to trickle down. Uh, what we believe is that at political level, of course, various different entities could, um, could negotiate with the Taliban, the Doha office in, in Afghanistan and through intermediaries, regional um, powers, they can uh, negotiate on, on certain issues. But most of the issues should be negotiated through insider mediators, so uh, women, uh, men who uh, hold authority through traditional means or, or, or their religious scholars, let's say, their uh, humanitarian workers and so on, people who already have some leeway into the, into the community. So this is, this is really important. And, and we've seen some good examples of this around community education, around um, use of contraceptions and uh, sexual reproductive health. We've seen some good examples around vaccinations. So these things now need to be systematically um, implemented and looked at. I, we very much believe that organizations like Search, who focuses on community peace building and on peace building at the political level, we, this is a good time for us to, to have our engagement with the humanitarian field, with the development field, closer, because this is where we bring in our expertise 
and then our uh, counterparts being in theirs. And at the moment, we don't believe that either of us can work separately. Um, and we believe that a lot of humanitarian aid would get to the right people at the right time um, in the right way with all the considerations that uh, my colleagues mentioned. Uh, only if on the ground people that are receiving aid, that are distributing aid, that are working at the, at, at, at the community level are aware of these principles of mediation and in, 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 in ensuring that conflict does not escalate, that things that are likely to cause further divide between already very divided communities do not cause harm. Um, so this is the kind of, uh, this is a kind of um, belief we have. However, it, how does it work in practice? Right now, uh, we don't know who's in the country and who has left. Um, we don't know about uh, the personnel that we have available on our disposal who could be doing this. A lot of the networks are affected by the mass departures, by mass closures of projects and projects and so on. So I completely think that we should start from identifying where our strengths lie and then sort of slowly build on, consolidate on a very localized approach to continuous mediation at various different levels. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I want to come back to Orvasi. You know, um, as Zura mentioned, there was extensive networks, extensive work happening around the country, and there's obviously going to be some moment to identify what's been lost, what's paused, what can be picked up. Um, one one issue that that we've raised, um, you know, and you spoke about at the beginning was. Um, the existing humanitarian needs prior to this. And there was a humanitarian response plan that called for, you know, over one point, I think it was approximately $1.3 billion um, for assistance um, for Afghanistan, which was less than 40% funded. And um, from from your perspective, sitting within UNHCR and within the, the UN system, um, are there conversations happening now or will they take place soon about, what a coordinated response to the new Afghanistan can look like, and what do you think that what you know what 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 does that look like? What are we what should we be thinking about um, you know in this in this moment of uncertainty, but knowing having a pretty clear picture of both the existing needs and the existing capacities up till up till a few weeks ago. Thank you, Jake. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the, for the situation in Afghanistan, the interagency humanitarian response plan um, remains the operational framework and vehicle for us to be able to raise critical funds. And thank you very much, Jake, uh, for highlighting the urgent needs in your recent article. Uh, the plan sets out the needs of nearly $1.3 billion for more than 18 million people in need, of which, regrettably today, um, is less than 40% funded. And without adequate funding, UNHCR would find it very difficult to continue with the provision of protection and the provision of essential items such as tents, hygiene kits and sanitary support to the Afghan people. Today, our Deputy High Commissioner, who many of you know, uh, also launched an interagency re regional preparedness and response plan for neighboring countries, which has been led by UNHCR. This is for requirements from July to December 2021 and includes 11 partners so far. Its objective is primarily to support host countries to prepare and should refugees need to flee, respond to the needs in host communities, in the host countries, Iran, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and uh, Uzbekistan. It will be critical that these appeals are properly funded so we can support the Afghan populations, whether they be in the country or whether they be forcibly displaced outside um, and at this point, I will, early on in the show, I'll, I'll say we, will, we continue to count on strong U.S. support for our refugee and IDP response. Thanks. Can I just um, ask you to speak a little bit? You mentioned protection. Um, can you, you know, for people within the humanitarian community, I think that concept is very well, well, sometimes well understood. But can you talk a little bit about um, what you mean when we talk about civilian protection in this context and what steps UNHCR can take and, and other partners can take um, now and into the future? Absolutely. Well, let me first say uh, we very much echo the Secretary General's calls for protection of civilians in Afghanistan. 
And I'll just briefly touch on three ways these efforts could be supported. First, uh, safe, secure and unimpeded humanitarian access throughout the country is what will enable us to provide essential assistance and protection to the Afghan people, particularly for UNHCR, to those who are internally displaced. We hope this will be ensured, particularly for our female staff, by the authorities as we move forward. Second, the protection of women and children more generally will be critically important. As I mentioned earlier, the Taliban have provided some reassurances that they will be protected, and we hope these words will translate into concrete action in the coming period. Third, access to asylum in neighboring countries will be critical for the protection of civilians, particularly should Afghans need to flee conflict or insecurity. As I have mentioned, we are calling on neighboring countries to allow safe refuge for Afghans who may need it. Um, we call on the international community and all those who have influence to support us in pursuit of these key areas, among, among others that will inevitably arise. Thank you. Um, I want to, Katie, come back to you and, and this issue of um, the neighboring countries. You raised it and now Ravasi has raised it. And you, you referenced the sensitivity in particular with Iran, but can you speak a little bit about what that engagement will look like from the perspective of, you know, of US based NGOs and how um, how we can think about effectively supporting both financially and politically um, refugee populations in those countries? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, so first of all, let's just take Pakistan, um, for, for example. Um, the domestic legal and regulatory environment um, has not been conducive um, for the NGO community to be able to register, um, you know, receive the permissions they need to be able to, you know, go out and, and provide services um, and, and what have you. And there are, you know, very, uh, very valid reasons for, for why, you know, that has been so challenging. Um, but using that as an example, um, what would be helpful right now on the operating environment is for governments um, such as the U.S. and others um, to really be engaging through humanitarian diplomacy now with these regional countries um, on an enabling environment for the NGO community and civil society. So looking at legal, regulatory and compliance frameworks and making sure that they are conducive for registration, scale up, um, you know, moving people and, and goods in. That also, you know, requires really looking at, um, you know, uh, any um, restrictive measures that impact the community's ability to work in these regional contexts. Um, you know, Pakistan, Iran, um, you know, and, and elsewhere, it's, it's a very restrictive environment as it is. Um, and so multilaterally, that needs to be examined. Um, and again, that's back to the safeguards um, points that I was making earlier. Um, and um, as well as bilateral, um, you know, restrictive measures, you know, such as those imposed by the United States government on Iran, for example, you know, where can the safeguards be built in um, to allow the NGO community to, to operate? Now, likewise, and, and I'm sure my colleague from UNHCR, um, you know, has some has some some really good um, remarks on this, but you know, it's also not a necessarily a friendly region for displaced people, for for refugees, um, particularly for Afghan refugees. So it also, you know, there also needs to be diplomatic efforts and and you know community engagement and support to really welcome, um, you know, folks who are fleeing for their lives um, from a well-founded fear of violence and persecution. Um, and so, you know, in order for them to realize their rights under international law, that also requires regional countries to keep borders open, um, to allow um, people who, again, are fearing a well-founded, you know, fear of persecution to be able to access the safety and the refuge that they are legally entitled um, to, to receive, so. Thanks, uh, you know, we, um, earlier in this year, we held some meetings and um the number of returns from iran and pakistan was increasing and i think there needs to be recognition on the part of the international community that in addition to the financial and logistical issues at play the impacts of covid um and the downturn on the economies and in, in these countries also plays a part and i think that that 
that understanding can contribute, I think, to this idea of humanitarian diplomacy, recognizing the totality of need, both for the, the affected population, but also for those host governments and the host communities in which those those refugees or IDPs um, and for those internally displaced end up in. Um, as we start to, to come to the end of our time, I want to come back to you, um, Zura, and ask you a question. I mean, you talked about engaging with the Taliban. You also talked about um, at the onset um, the disconnect a little bit between things that you're saying and things that you're seeing. So is there is there a consensus amongst colleagues within the, the peace building and NGO community about a path forward? Are there are there steps that you think you can take to get buy in from leadership uh, from the Taliban leadership? And what should we be looking for to, to you know, as external observers, um, as, as indicators of um, actions matching rhetoric uh, on the part of the detective? Well, um, it's, a, it's a very tough question to answer. I mean, um, I am personally waiting to see what the Taliban uh, do. Uh, so I can decide to go back or not. So I am not sure um, if, if, if I would see um, the, the, their action based on what they have said, which was that they would allow women to work and so on, um, because I could see in the last 10 days they have uh, said women could work and then they have uh, erected parameters around it and, and have basically said that uh, they can work only under certain circumstances and those circumstances do not exist. So um, I think what... Um, I, I, I talked to a lot of people who lived and worked under the Taliban rule previous time, both um, Afghan nationals and our international uh, colleagues. And um, they reassure me that, uh, that they can see some changes and they, uh, they link this change in the Taliban onto two, with two things. Number one, Taliban of 2021 has been exposed to more Islamic um, societies and communities. Previously, the Taliban uh, were only very, uh, they, they, they had experienced very small, um, sort of, they had experienced small spaces and they hadn't seen variety of interpretations of Islam, variety of um, different types of uh, women's dresses and, 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 and women's activity in the public and so on. So they, they, they reassure me that, that they can see as they talk to these Taliban from the humanitarian agency's perspective, from human rights organizations' perspective, from think tank perspectives, that they can see that, that, that the Taliban are, um, are considering genuinely um, a freeing up of, uh, of some, on, on some of the freedoms of men and women, but women in particular. Um, but I suggest a wait and watch approach. But also I suggest a diversification in uh, the way we, um, put forward our demands to them. I believe that we do not need a unity in, in our approach. I believe that some of us should retain our very hardline uh, belief that unless the Taliban guarantee 100% equality between men and women in this particular activity or sector, I'm going to withdraw my support. That is good. Uh, that is good and valid uh, stance to take. But then we should also respect the various different other um, kind of responses. They could be people, they could be agencies who believe that it would be better for them to engage with the Taliban under certain, certain restrictive rule um, um, so that they can um, deliver. Uh, now, the key here is, in my opinion, that the agencies need to match their decision on how they engage with the Taliban and, and match it with how they support their, their vulnerable staff and their female staff, for example. Um, if an agency believes that, uh, that uh, they will engage with the Taliban uh, under, and accept certain restrictions on their activities, then they need to think how can they fund those restrictions? How can they create an environment conducive to the women's um, employment? How can they enable their women employees to work from home? I'm talking from a very personal place here. Um, and, and, and I don't want us to get to a point where we are delivering something at the cost of the uh, creating restrictions for women 
um, and, and feel and feel okay about it. That should never be um, never be the case. So the agencies, whatever decision they take in this continuum of full uh, engagement with the Taliban and, and uh, disengagement with the Taliban and pressurizing them to show action, um, uh, putting in action the, their their words. So this is this is really important. Um, now, um, I think the Taliban are as shocked as all of us are um, with all of these sudden changes. And it's a good thing um, that they are shocked because when, when they are shocked, they're, they're still forming their ideas and so on. So even now is a good time to engage. And this is where the, um, the, the, the friends of Afghanistan could, could take, a, take more action than Afghans themselves, because we are, of course, in the middle of the crisis, especially those of us um, based in Afghanistan. So this is where you can push the envelope a little bit around girls' education. I haven't seen a lot of international engagement around, for example, girls' access to education, women's access to health care, um, and a lot of uh, issues around this basic, um, basic rights that most Afghan women are concerned about. I haven't seen a lot of pushing even in, in, in rhetoric uh, on this internationally. Um, so this is, that, this is really important. So as we are, we should not wait, um, we should wait to see how they act, but we should not wait to show any reaction. Um, this, uh, this is my opinion. And I, I wish I could share my uh, more wise colleagues' uh, belief that the Taliban have changed, um, but I'm yet to see that. Um, and the Taliban um, need to know that people like us are watching to see how they have changed or not. Um, and around international, uh, around humanitarian um, um, action, I think this is the safest. This is the safest uh, thing to test them on. Um, they have never. They've never said that Afghanistan is fine without humanitarian action. They've continuously said that this is something they need. Let's test them on this. And then slowly we can see um, how they are going to react, how much they have changed, and how much are they willing to engage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Orbasi, I want to um, come back to you. And, and we, we may have some questions from, from the viewers, but um, you know, we have an audience here in Washington. You know, what are the the two or three or one or two um, key elements of support that you um, at UNHCR would need from the international community um, in order to to stay and support Afghan civilians? And what is what are those key messages that you'd like to reinforce? Um, you know, as you recalibrate and rethink about how you can continue your work. Thank you very much. I mean, I think uh, the key issue is international solidarity and burden sharing on many, many fronts, including making sure that, as Zura said, you know, uh, working in an environment that delivers humanitarian assistance in the scope of where we are today. Um, so we would very much want to be having un unimpeded access to the beneficiaries. We would need security. We would need access to territory if refugees decide, to, you know, if people decide to go to um, the neighboring countries. We have protection advocacy issues uh, related to access to asylum issues, uh, asylum procedures as well. And of course, the, the very, very important principle of um, asking uh, all governments to look at the situation of the Afghans today. Um, and respect our non-advisory, um, non-return advisory pronouncement and really, you know, have people not return Afghans who may be failed asylum seekers to uh, return today in this current context um, that is so, so difficult for even those who've remained. So those who've been away for a long time would find it virtually impossible um, to manage in this very, very um, volatile situation. And I think these are the kind of um, support network that we need as UNHCR, as a humanitarian agency, to be able to deliver uh, in Afghanistan today. Thanks. Um, Katie, I want to, um, we, we have a question from, from the audience about the access and operational challenges. And, and there's, there's those that we intuitively understand just by watching the news, but are there other things 
Um, I've been reading about supply chains being disrupted, things of that nature. So one, are there other operational, um, you know, sort of, I wouldn't say second order, but kind of non-headline making challenges that um, NGO partners are experiencing? And then I'd put that same question I just put to Ravasi to you of, you know, what are the, the one or two key messages that the humanitarian community um, would wish to convey um, that would be necessary um, to allow them to continue to provide services? Yeah, I mean, other operational kind of non-headline issues on access, I mean, I've, I've, I think I've touched upon it. Um, it's really the financial, um, it's, it's the financial bit. Um, I mean, what I'm hearing right now from all of our members that are working in Afghanistan is they need to be able to get cash in to be able to pay their staff and to run programs. Um, and they need the legal protection to be able to do that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how headliney or, or not headliney that is, um, but that's really the, the main problem right now um, that needs to be addressed. Uh, thanks. I think it's it's headlining enough because we the broader scope challenge of bank closures and ATM closures um, has captured the news because I it the overarching economic conditions in Afghanistan will have second and third order effects on the humanitarian operations and the inability to access financial services you know in a on a macro scale and for individual Afghans will just undermine the ability to for those who can, for those who are able to carry out economic activity and, and are self-sufficient. I mean, the the inability to access those um, their own money, let alone the international financial system, um, is is clearly going to have uh, a, a severe economic impact and and create um, you know exacerbating conditions for the humanitarian situation specifically. Um, Zura, I want to just finish with you and and give you a chance. Are there any kind of key key final messages you'd like to share from your perspective? Um, you know, Dubai based, but as a Kabul based um, colleague um, for for our audience for the international. Well, um, I think uh, with I, I would I would answer the question you asked earlier. Um, I would uh, say in terms of the challenges, operational challenges. One, there are two operational challenges I want to uh, highlight, and one of them is the fact that Afghanistan has just lost almost nearly, probably um, two hundred thousand of um, its educated, uh, mostly employed young uh, men and women. And this is going to have an impact. I know organizations who did an amazing job on the ground, but their um, women um, in their ranks have completely um, gone. And this is going to create problems. So there's going to be a, a personnel challenge uh, that we need to address. Uh, perhaps, again, this is not a, a, a big uh, big issue to, to, to bring up, but operationally, especially in the field, in humanitarian field, where you do need uh, people. This is, uh, this is incredibly important. And the second thing is we are very much focusing on what the Taliban are going to do in terms of sort of gender issues, uh, women's rights and so on. But we need to also remember that Afghanistan was already dealing with a lot of um, issues around, um, say, gender-based violence and so on against women. And all of the protection mechanisms, um, uh, legal protection and, 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 and systems have uh, overnight disappeared. Uh, so laws are no longer applicable. The police and the judiciary and so on are no longer there. Legal aid providers are no longer there. So it, this, create, this creates a horrific gap. Um, and as we move forward in terms of protection, we need to really think about um, scaling up our prevent, prevention work. And this is something I'd like to uh, leave everybody with um, because Afghanistan has now gone up in the in the attention of the media and, and, and a lot of different communities. But um, we have had problems that we were trying to resolve uh, that predates the last 10 days. And, and we really need to consider those as well as the new challenges. Thank you. Thanks. That's an in incredibly important point. And um, uh, it speaks to our interest in in today's conversation and in continuing to work with you and, and our colleagues at Interaction and UNHCR and the rest of the humanitarian and peace building and development communities. Um, so um, on behalf of CSAS, thank you very much, um, Zura Bahman from Searcher Common Ground, 
Ravasi Patel from UNHCR and, and Katie Strifolino for joining us today. Um, this is the conversation will be posted in its entirety on our website um, immediately after our, our conclusion. And we look forward to working with, um, with all of our, our viewers, our partners today um, to continue to highlight the urgent humanitarian needs in, in Afghanistan and elsewhere, and in particular for women, girls, and other vulnerable populations. So thank you again for joining us for your comments and for your work, and we wish you a good day. Thank you.